The Indian language and dialects appear to have the very idiom and genius of the Hebrew. Their words and sentences are expressive, concise, emphatical, sonorous, and bold, and often both in letters and signification synonymous with the Hebrew language. It is a common and old remark that there is no language in which some Hebrew words are not to be found. Probably Hebrew was the first and only language till distance of time and place introduced a change and then soon followed a mixture of others. The accidental position of the characters might also coincide with some Hebrew words in various dialects without the least intention, as the true pronunciation of the Hebrew characters is lost in a considerable degree. It is too difficult a task for a skillful Hebrist to ascertain a satisfactory identity of language between the Jews and American Aborigines, much more so to an Indian trader who professes but a small acquaintance with the Hebrew and that acquired by his own application. However, I will endeavor to make up for the deficiency of Hebrew with plenty of good solid Indian roots. The Indian nouns have neither cases nor declensions, they are invariably the same through both numbers after the Hebrew manner. In their verbs, they likewise sometimes use the preterperfect instead of the present tense of the indicative mood. As blasas ayare, apisare, yesterday I went and saw, and imako ayare, apisare, now I go and see. Like the Hebrews, they have no comparative or superlative degree. They express a preference by the opposite extremes. As Chekostin, you are virtuous, sahakse, I am vicious, but it implies a comparative degree and signifies you are more virtuous than I am. By prefixing the adverbs, which express little and much to the former words, it conveys the same meaning, the former of which is agreeable to the Hebrew idiom. A double repetition of the same adjective makes a superlative according to the Hebrew manner, as lawa, lawa, most or very many, to add ha to the end of an adjective, unless it is a noun of multitude like the former makes it also a superlative. As hakse to ha, they are most or very wicked. Hakse signifies vicious. Probably when the vicious part of the Israelites were under the hand of the corrector, the judge repeated that word. Ta is a note of plurality and ha an Hebrew accent of admiration, which makes it a superlative. To join the name of God or the leading vowel of the mysterious great divine name to the end of a noun likewise implies a superlative as haxi ishto or haxio, he or she is very wicked. The former method of speech exactly agrees with the Hebrew idiom, as the original text shows in innumerable instances. When the Hebrews compare two things and would signify a parity between them, they double the particle of resemblance. I am as thou art, and my people as thy people. And the Indians, on account of that original defective standard of speech, are forced to use the like circumlocution, as che ahoha sia, I am like you, and sahotuk chehoduk tua and si. For hadok signifies people, and the s expresses the pronoun my or mine, and it likewise changes an active into a passive verb. Although this Indian and Hebrew method of speech is rather tedious and defective, yet at the same time, they who attain any tolerable skill in the dialects of the one and language of the other, will discover the sense plain enough when a comparison is implied. There is not, perhaps, any one language or speech, except the Hebrew and the Indian American, which has not a great many prepositions. The Indians, like the Hebrews, have none in separate and express words. They are forced to join certain characters to words in order to supply that great defect. The Hebrew consonants called services were tools to supply the place of the prepositions. The Indians, for want of a sufficient number of radical words, are forced to apply the same noun and verb to signify many things of a various nature. With the Chirek, Ianke signifies a prisoner, captive, slave, all, pin, needle, and in sea, which occasions the Indian dialects to be very difficult to strangers. The Jewish rabbins tell us that the Hebrew language contains only a few more than a thousand primitive words, of which their whole language is formed so the same word very often denotes various, though not contrary, things. But there is one radical meaning, which will agree with every sense that the word is used in. By custom, a Hebrew noun frequently supplied the place of a pronoun, which means it caused a tedious and sometimes ambiguous circumlocution. From this original defective standard of speech, the Indians have forgotten all their pronouns, 
except two primitives and two relatives. Anoa, Ego, and Ishna too. The latter bears a great many significations, both as singular and plural, viz. Iapa and Iako, which signify he, she, this, that. The Hebrew language frequently uses hyperboles, or magnifying numbers, to denote a long space of time. The Indians accordingly apply the words Nitak Akruha, all days, or in other words forever, to a long series of years. With the Jews, sitting, signified dwelling, and with the Indians it is the very same. For when they ask a person where he dwells, they say, Katmuk Ishbanil, which is literally, where do you sit? And when they call us irreligious, they say, Nana Ubat, nothing, or literally, a relation to nothing. For Nana signifies a relation, and the other is always a negative adverbial period, which seems also to proceed from a religious custom of the Hebrews in giving despicable borrowed names to idols, as to Balim, particles of air, meaning nothing, to which the psalmist alludes, saying, I will not take up their names in my lips. And St. Paul says, We know that an idol is nothing. This expression the Indians apply in a pointed metaphor to the white people, but never to each other. Like the Hebrews, they seldom, if ever, double the liquid consonant R, for they generally seem desirous of shuffling over it at any rate, and they often give it the sound of L, but if it precedes a word, where the other consonant soon follows, they always give it its proper sound, contrary to the usage of the Chinese, as the name of a stone they often call Tala instead of Tark. But the Indians say Tare Lakana literally, yellow stone, the Hebrews subjoined one of their services to words to express the pronoun relative, thy or thine, and as that particle was also a note of resemblance, it shows the great sterility of that language. As a specimen, they said a biche, your father, and a meche, your mother. Only that the Hebrew period is initial, in such a case, to the Indian nouns, they always use the very same method of expression. This I shall illustrate with two words in the dialects of the Chickasaw and Chirake, as Chinga and Chatoka, your father, Anga and Akatoda signifying my father, in resemblance of Abba of the same import, likewise Chishke and Chachia, your mother, for Saski and Akache signify my mother in imitation ash. Also, Sas Kish signifies Podex Meus, Chishkish Podex Tus, and Kish Kish Podex Ilius which I guess to be an opprobrious allusion to Kish, the father of Saul, for the sons assuming the throne at the end of the Jewish theocracy. In their adjectives and verbs, they use the same method of speech. As Nahorxo Chin Chukoma, your book is good. The former word is compounded of Na, now, or the present time, and Horxo, delineated, marked, or painted. Aya signifies to go, and Maya Cha, go along, or Maya the same, for by prefixing to it, it implies a requisite obedience. In like manner, a pisa, to see, and pisacha, look, or see you. And when that particle is prefixed to a verb, it always expresses the accusative case of the same pronoun. As chepisar, I saw you, and chepisaras, I shall see you. Each of the Hebrew characters are radicals, although half of them are services, according to that proper term of the scholiasts. For, when they are prefixed, inserted, or subjoined, either at the beginning, middle, or end of a radical word, they serve to form its various augments, inflections, and derivatives. According to this difficult standard of speech, the Indian nouns, moods, and tenses are variously formed to express different things. As there is no other known language or dialect, which has the same tedious, narrow, and difficult principles, must we not consider them to be twin-born sisters? The want of proper skill to observe the original fixed idea of the Indian words, their radical letters, and the due founds in each of them, seems to have been the only reason why the writers on the American Aborigines have not exhibited the true and genuine properties of any one of their dialects, as they are all uniform in principle, so far at least as an extensive acquaintance reaches. The Hebrew nouns are either derived from verbs or both of them are one and the same, as Barosh, blessing, from Barak, to bless, and Dabar Deber, he spoke the speech. This proper name signifies loquacious, like the Indian Sekaki, signifying the grasshopper, the Indian method of expression, exactly agree with that Hebrew mode of speech. For they say, Anumbale, Anumbale, I spake the speaking, and Anumbale, Anumbale, 
he spoke the speaking or speech. And by inserting the name of God between these two words, their meaning is the very same with those two first Hebrew words. I shall subjoin another word of the same sort. Hukselkta signifies a shutting instrument. And they say, Ishtukselkta, or Hukselkta, Ishhuksidas, or Huxida Cha, you shall, or shut you the door. Their period of the last word always denotes the second person singular of the imperative mood, and that of the other preceding it, either the first or second person singular of the indicative mood, which is formed so by a fixed rule, on account of the variegating power of the serviles, by affixing, inserting, or suffixing them to any root. According to the usage of the Hebrews, they always place the accusative case also before the verb, as in the former Indian words. With the Hebrews, signified a prayer, or a religious invocation, derived from Phalak, to pray to or invoke the deity, in a strong resemblance thereof, when the Indians are performing their sacred dance with the eagle's tails, and with great earnestness invoking yo he wa to bless them with success and prosperity, fail signifies waving or invoking by waving, ish fail, you wave, falca, wave you, afalali, I waved, afal class, I will wave. Psalmodists seem to have borrowed the notes fa la from the aforesaid Hebrew words of praying, singing to, or invoking Elohim, fool, to work, is evidently drawn from the former Hebrew word, which signifies to invoke Yohewa. The greatest part of the Levitical method of worshipping consisted of laborious mechanical exercises, much after the Indian manner, which the popish priests copy after in a great many instances as pulling off their clothes and putting on others. Imagining that the deity is better pleased with persons who variegate their external appearances like Proteus than with those who worship with a steady, sincere disposition of mind. Besides a prodigious group of other superstitious ceremonies, which are often shamefully blended with those of the old pagans. As the Hebrew word na signifies the present time, so when the Indians desire a person to receive something from them speedily, they say, Naesha, take it now. He replies unta or ome, which are good-natured affirmatives. The pronoun relative, you, which they term ishna, is a compounded Hebrew word, signifying the person present, or you, with the Hebrews, harahara signifies most or very hot. The repetition of the word makes it a superlative. In a strict resemblance of that word and mode of speech, when an Indian is baffled by any of their humorous wits, he says in a loud, jesting manner, Hara Hara or Hala Hala, according to their capacity of pronouncing the liquid R, and it signifies, you are very hot upon me. Their word, which expresses sharp, conveys the idea of bitter heartedness with them, and that of bitterness they apply only to the objects of taste. With the Chirake, Chikasa, and Chokta Indians, Nance signifies a hill, and Nane, with the two last mentioned nations, a fish, and Unchaba, a mountain but they call an alligator or crocodile nane chunchaba, literally, the fish like a mountain, which the English language would abbreviate into the name of a mountain fish. But instead of a hyphen, they use the Hebrew, a note of resemblance, which seems to point at the language from which they derived it. In like manner, a-a signifies to walk, and a-et, wood, but a-et chana, any kind of wheel, which is consonant to the aforesaid Hebrew idiom, with many others of the like nature, but a specimen of this sort must suffice. The Hebrew and Indian words, which express delineating, writing, deciphering, marking, and painting, convey the same literal meaning in both languages. As Cheteba Sefar delineate this with delineations, and, with the Indians, Horzo is, in like manner, the radical name of books, delineating, and Utena that for numbering, instead of reading. The nearest approach they can make to it is anumbole horzo ishanumbolas. You shall speak the speech, which is delineated. They call a razor, baspu shafi, a shaving knife. And shafi always signifies to shave, probably because when they first began to shave themselves, they were ridiculed by the higher or more religious part of the people for imitating that heathenish custom. The Hebrew Shafi, signifying lip, confession, or worship, which divine writ assures us the descendants of Noah changed when they opposed the divine will of settling various parts of the earth and built the great tower of Babel as an emblem of greatness to get them a name.
Lok signifies fire, and Lok Ishtahulo, the holy or divine fire, or the anger of Ishtahulo, the great holy one, which nearly agrees with the Hebrew that which flames or scorches with vehement heat. It is the scripture method of conveying to us a sensible idea of the divine wrath, according to the Kerubic name which likewise signifies fire. But the Persians worshipped the burning fire, by the name of Oromazes, and darkness, or the spirit, by that of Aramanius, quite contrary to the religious system of the Indian Americans, and the aforesaid Indian method of expression seems exactly to coincide with the Hebrew idiom. Bukshi Amma is the name of their Indian flap, or broad slip of cloth with which the men cover their nakedness. But the word they use to express our sort of breeches is a compound, balafuka, derived from the Hebrew, which signifies behind, and the Indian napuka, a coat, any kind of clothes or covering. Baloka signifies behind, silently telling us they formerly wore a different sort of breeches to what they use at present. They likewise say nipefuka a flesh covering. The father of King Saul was called Kish, Podex, which signifies also the rear of an army, or the hindermost person, according to the Hebrew idiom. Thus the Indians, by Kish, express the Podex of any animal, the hindermost person, the gavel end of a house, and the like. Kish Kish is with them a superlative, and, as before hinted, used to convey the contempt they have for that proper name. May not the contemptible idea the West Florida Mississippi Indians affixed to the name of Kish be on account of his son's succession to the throne at the end of the theocracy of Israel and the beginning of a despotic regal government? The Indians, according to the usage of the Hebrews, always prefix the substantive to the adjective, as Netak Chukoma, a good day, Nakan and Eho Chukoma, a good or goodly man and woman, the former of which is termed in Hebrew Yoma Toba, signifying, according to our method of salutation, a good day, a merry season, a festival day. The Indian appellatives are similarly expressed in Hebrew Beitobi and Ashtob, a good, goodly, discreet, or wise man and woman. Chukoma, with the Indians, is the proper name of a comely woman when A is prefixed to it, as A Chukoma, my goodly, or beautiful. They use it for a warrior when it is compounded without the A, as Chukoma Humashtabe, one who killed a beautiful great red or war chieftain, which is compounded of Chukoma, Kumli, Hama, Red, Ash, Fire, and Abe, a contraction of Abel, signifying grief or sorrow. Hence it appears that because the Hebrews affixed a virtuous idea to Tob, goodly, the Indians call white by the same name and make it the constant emblem of everything that is good, according to a similar Hebrew custom. Of this, the sacred oracles make frequent mention. The Jews called that which was the most excellent of everything, the fat. And the Indians, in like manner, say, Usto Nihi, the fat of the Pompeian, Tranch Nibi, the fat of the corn. Neha is the adjective, signifying fat, from which the word Nita, a bear, is derived. They apply the word heart only to animate beings, as the deity is the soul of every system, and as every nation, from the remotest ages of antiquity, believed that they could not live well without some god or other. When therefore we clearly understand the name or names by which any society of people express their notions of a deity, we can with more precision form ideas of the nature of their religious worship and of the object or objects of their adoration. I shall therefore here give a plain description of the names by which the Indian Americans speak of God. Ishtahullo is an appellative for God. Ishtahullo points at the greatness, purity, and goodness of the Creator in forming. It is derived from Ishto, great, which was the usual name of God through all the prophetic writings. Likewise, from the present tense of the infinitive mood of the active verb Ahulo, I love, and from the present tense of the passive verb Hulo, which signifies sanctifying, sanctified, divine, or holy, Women set apart they term hulo, i.e., sanctifying themselves to ishtahulo. Likewise, netaghulo signifies a sanctified, divine, or holy day. And, in like manner, ukahulo, water sanctified, and see. So that ishtahulo, when applied to God in its true radical meaning, imports the great, beloved, holy cause which is exceedingly comprehensive and more expressive of the true nature of God than the Hebrew name Adonai, 
which is applicable to a human being. Whenever the Indians apply the epithet, compounded, to any of their own religious men, it signifies the great, holy, beloved, and sanctified men of the Holy One. There is a species of tea that grows spontaneously and in great plenty along the sea coast of the two Carolinas, Georgia, and East and West Florida, which we call Yopon or Casina. The Indians transplant and are extremely fond of it. They drink it on certain stated occasions and in their most religious solemnities with awful invocations. But the women and children and those who have not successfully accompanied their holy ark, pro aris et focus, dare not even enter the sacred square when they are on this religious duty. Otherwise, they would be dry, scratched with snake's teeth, fixed in the middle of a split reed or piece of wood, without the privilege of warm water to supple the stiffened skin. When this beloved liquid, or supposed holy drink offering, is fully prepared and fit to be drank, one of their magi brings two old consecrated large conch shells, out of a place appropriated for containing the holy things, and delivers them into the hands of two religious attendants, who, after a wild ceremony, fill them with the supposed sanctifying bitter liquid. Then they approach near to the two central red and white seats, stooping with their heads and bodies pretty low. Advancing a few steps in this posture, they carry their shells with both hands at an instant to one of the most principal men on those red and white seats, saying on a bass key, Ya, yeah, quite short. Then, in like manner, they retreat backward, facing each other, with their heads bowing forward, their arms across, rather below their breast, and their eyes half shut. Thus, in a very grave, solemn manner, they sing on a strong bass key the awful monosyllable, O, oh, for the space of a minute. Then they strike up majestic he on the treble with a very intent voice as long as their breath allows them, and on a bass key with a bold voice and short accent they at last utter the strong, mysterious sound, wah, and thus finish the great song or most solemn invocation of the divine essence. The notes together compose their sacred, mysterious name, Yohiwa. That this seems to be the true Hebrew pronunciation of the divine essential name, Jehovah will appear more obvious from the sound they seem to have given their characters. The Greeks, who chiefly copied their alphabet from the Hebrew, had not jod, but very nearly resembling the sound of our Y. The ancient Teutonic and Sclavonian dialects have Ya as an affirmative and use the consonant W instead of V. The high importance of the subject necessarily would lead these supposed red Hebrews, when separated from other people in America, to continue to repeat the favorite name of God, yo hi according to the ancient pronunciation. Contrary to the usage of all the ancient heathen world, the American Indians not only name God by several strong compounded appellatives, expressive of many of his divine attributes, but likewise say ya at the beginning of their religious dances, with a bowing posture of body, then they sing yo yo he he and repeat those sacred notes on every religious occasion. The religious attendants calling to Yah to enable them humbly to supplicate seems to point to the Hebrew custom of pronouncing Yah, which likewise signifies the divine essence. It is well known what sacred regard the Jews had for the four-lettered divine name, so as scarcely ever to mention it. But once a year, when the high priest went into the holy sanctuary at the expiation of sins, might not the Indians copy from them this sacred invocation? Their method of invoking God in a solemn hymn with that reverential deportment and spending a full breath on each of the two first syllables of the awful divine name hath a surprising analogy to the Jewish custom and such as no other nation or people, even with the advantage of written records, have retained. It may be worthy of notice that they never prostrate themselves nor bow their bodies to each other by way of salute or homage, though usual with the Eastern nations, except when they are making or renewing peace with strangers who come in the name of Yah. Then they bow their bodies in that religious solemnity, but they always bow in their religious dances, because then they sing what they call divine hymns, chiefly composed of the great beloved divine name and addressed to Yohewa. The favored persons, whom the religious attendants are invoking the divine essence to bless, hold up the shells with both hands to their mouths during the awful sacred invocation and retain a mouthful of the drink to spear it out on the ground as a supposed drink offering to the great self-existent giver, which they offer at the end of their draft.
If any of the traders who at those times were invited to drink with them were to neglect this religious observance, they would reckon us as godless and wild as the wolves of the desert. After the same manner, the supposed holy waiters proceed from the highest to the lowest in their synedrion. And when they have ended that awful solemnity, they go round the whole square or quadrangular place and collect tobacco from the sanctified sinners according to ancient custom. For they who serve at the altar must live by the altar. The Chirake method of adjuring a witness to declare the truth strongly corroborates the former hints and will serve as a key to open the vowels of the great, mysterious, four-lettered name of God. On small affairs, the judge, who is an elderly chieftain, asks the witness, Chiakoga, do you lie? To which he answers, Ansakaye Koga, I do not lie. But when the judge will search into something of material consequence and adjures the witness to speak the naked truth concerning the point in question, he says, O E A, what you have now said, is it true by this strong emblem of the beloved name of the great self existent God? To which the witness replies, O E A, it is true by this strong pointing symbol of Yohiwa. When the true knowledge of the affair in dispute seems to be of very great importance, the judge swears the witness thus, O E all, yeah, this most sacred adjuration imports. Have you now told me the real truth by the lively type of the great awful name of God, which describes his necessary existence without beginning or end, and by his self existent literal name, in which I adjure you? The witness answers, O E A, yeah. I have told you the naked truth, which I most solemnly swear by this strong religious picture of the adorable, great, divine, self-existent name, which we are not to profane, and I likewise attest it by his other beloved, unspeakable, sacred, essential name. Through a seeming war contempt of each other, they all use a favorite termination to their adjectives, very rarely to their substantives, and sometimes to their verbs especially when they are flourishing away in their rapid war speeches, which on such occasions they always repeat with great vehemence. I shall give a specimen of two words in the dialects of our southern Indians. R.I. is the favorite period of the Catawba Indians, as Mararu, or Wararai, good, and Martawarai, or Waktawarai, best, or very good, wa. The last syllable of the great divine name is evidently the radix, and magnifies the virtuous idea to a superlative. In like manner, shigarwari, not bad, but shikar rai signifies bad. With these Indians, shik is the name of a buzzard, which they reckon to be a most impure fowl, as it lives on putrid carcasses, upon which account they choose that word to convey a vicious idea. Quo is the sounding termination of the chirake, as sexta quo, good, and o seyu, best, or very good. Here they seem to have studiously chosen the vowels, as the following words will illustrate, tonate u, very honest, or virtuous, and y-o-u, evil, or very bad. To corroborate the hints I gave concerning the Indian names of monkey and the human species, let it be observed that though their words convey a virtuous or vicious idea, in proportion as they are constituted out of any of their three divine names, Yohewa, Ya, and Istohulo, or contain the vowels of the great sacred name, yet the aforesaid word Y-O-U is so far from being a deviation from that general custom, it is an emphatical and emblematical term to express evil by the negative of good, for as it is the only substantive or adjective of that word, it is a strong expressive symbol of the nature and physical cause of moral evil by separating Yo the first syllable of the divine four-lettered name into two syllables, and adding you as a superlative period to make it malum malorum. Shich is the sounding criterion of the Muskoga, or Creek Indians, a kind of cant jargon, for example. Hitla she signifies good, and hitla wa is she very good. According to their universal standard of speech, it becomes a superlative by subjoining that part of the divine name to it. With the Chickasaw and Choctaw, Hitla signifies dancing, probably because that religious exercise was good and highly pleasing to them, when, according to ancient custom, they danced in their symbolical circles to and before Yo-Hi-Wa.
With the former, Apollo Haig She expresses bad or evil, thereby inverting the divine letters. Ske is the favorite termination of the Chickasaw and Choctaw, as Chukomaske, good, Chukomasto Ske, alluding to Ishto, very good, and Ukpruske, bad. Likewise, Ukprusto, worst or very bad. For by annexing the contracted initial part of the divine name, Ishtahulo, to the end of it, it is a superlative. These remarks may be of service to the inhabitants of our valuable and extensive barriers in order to discover the national name of those savages who now and then cut them off. Ukpruse, with those Indians, signifies accursed. The two last letters make only the same, which implies neuter passive, and, as Ukpru is the only substantive or adjective they use to express evil by doubling the leading vowel of the four-lettered divine name, both at the beginning and end of the word. May we not conjecture at its origin, as glancing at the introduction of sin or evil by man's overacting or innovating through a too curious knowledge or choice. Ye shall be as gods, and in order to gain the resemblance they ate what was forbidden. The greater number of their compounded words, and I believe every one of them, which convey a virtuous or pure idea, either have some syllables of the three divine names visibly glance at them, or have one or two vowels of the sacred name, yo he wa and generally begin with one of them, which I shall exemplify with a few Chikasa and Chirake words. Ise ahauk, deer, yanasa, buffalo, which as it begins with the divine name ya, contains no more of their beloved vowels. In like manner waka, cattle, ishki uchia, a mother. This last seems to be drawn from Isha, the mother of all mankind. Eho and Enekia signify a woman. The latter is derived from the active verb akekiuha, signifying to love ardently or like a woman. Nakan askai, a man. From this word, the Chikasa derive naka, the name of an arrow or bullet, and with the Chirek askai signifies to fear, as all the American brute animals were afraid of man. Words which imply either a vicious or impure idea generally begin with a consonant and double those favorite vowels either at the beginning and end or in the middle of such words. As Nasuba Wohia, a wolf, with the Chickasaw, Yasuba signifies bewildered, Pacha, a pigeon, and Pacha Yasuba, a turtle dove, Sur and Sheik, are the Chickasaw and Chireki names of a turkey buzzard, Chula and Chuchola, a fox, and Shukwa and Sikwa, an opossum or hog, Ukuna, a polecat, Ukuna, a badger, Chukfe and Chisto, a rabbit. The last word is derived from the defective verb chesty, forbear, or do not meddle with, and rabbits were prohibited to the Israelites. In like manner, Upa and Ukuku, a night owl, Ufi and Kira, a dog, Nahula and Uneka, white people, or impure animals, the Chikasa both corrupt and transpose the last part of the divine name, Ishtahulo, and the Chirek invert their magnifying termination, U, to convey an impure idea. And through the like faint allusion to this divine name, Hulo signifies idols, pictures, or images, a sharp-pointed sarcasm. For the word Hulo signifies also menstruous women, who were for the time an equal abomination to the Israelites, and with whom they were to have no communion. These two words seem to bear the same analogy to each other as Al, a name of God, and Aleh, signifying the covenant of the Holy One to redeem man, and Aloha, execrated or accursed of God as idols were. The English characters cannot be brought any nearer to the true pronunciation of the Indian words than as above set down, so that former writers have notoriously strayed by writing conjecturally or taking things on the wing of fame. What Indian words we had being exceedingly mangled, either by the fault of the press or of torturing pens, heretofore induced skillful persons to conjecture them to be hieroglyphical characters in imitation of the ancient Egyptian manner of writing their chronicles. The Indians express themselves with a great deal of vehemence and with short pauses in all their set speeches. But, in common discourse, they express themselves according to our usual method of speech, only when they scold each other, which I never observed, unless they were intoxicated with spiritous liquors or casually overheard a husband when sober in his own family. They always act the part of a Stoic philosopher in outward appearance and never speak above their natural key.
and in their philosophic way of reasoning, their language is the more sharp and biting like keen irony and satyr that kills whom it praises. They know that thus they correct and subdue the first boilings of anger, which, if unchecked, proves one of the most dangerous passions to which human nature is subject, so that remote savages who have heard only the jarring screeches of night owls and the roaring voices of ravenous beasts of prey in this respect give lessons and set a worthy example to our most civilized nations. I have heard several eloquent Indian leaders, just as they were ready to set off for war, to use as bold metaphors and allegories in their speeches, and images almost as full and animating as the eloquent penman of the old divine book of Job, even where he is painting with his strong colors the gladness and contempt of the beautiful war horse at the near approach of the enemy. I heard one of their captains, at the end of his oration for war, tell the warriors that stood outermost, he feelingly knew their guns were burning in their hands, their tomahawks thirsty to drink the blood of their enemy, and their trusty arrows impatient to be on the wing, and, lest delay should burn their hearts any longer, he gave them the cool, refreshing word, join the holy ark, and a way to cut off the devoted enemy. They immediately founded the shrill whoo-whoop, and struck up the solemn, awful song, Yo. In Virginia resides the remnant of an Indian tribe, who call themselves Sepon, which word, with the Egyptians, signifies the time of putting their wine into vessels, derived according to mythologists from Safan to enclose or conceal. From thence they form the fictitious Tisiphone, the punisher of sins, animated with hatred, and also the rest of their pretended furies, from the like circumstances of the year. Our early American writers have bestowed on these Indians an emperor, according to the Spanish copy, calling him Pauhatan, contrary to the Indian method of ending their proper names with a vowel, and have pictured them as a separate body of fierce, idolatrous cannibals. We, however, find them in the present day of the same temper and religious tenets as the rest of the Indian Americans in proportion to their situation in life. Considering the nearness of Egypt to Judea, they might have derived that appellative from the Egyptians, especially as here and in several of our American colonies are old towns called Cana. There was about thirty years ago a remnant of a nation or subdivided tribe of Indians called Canai, which resembles the Hebrew proper name. Their proper names always end with a vowel, and they seldom use a consonant at the end of any word. I cannot recollect any exceptions but the following, which are sonorous and seem to be of an ancient date. Oka, a swan, Ilpatak, a wing, Kushak, reeds, Shinuk, sand, Shutik, the skies, Fuchik, a star, Sunak, a kettle, skin, the eye, Ieep, a pond, and from which they derive the word Iepe, to bathe, which alludes to the eastern method of purifying themselves. Ilbak signifies a hand, and there are a few words that end with she, as Sulish, a tongue. The verbs are seldom defective or imperfect, though they may seem to be so to persons who do not understand the idiom of their language, they are not. They only appear as such by the near resemblance of words, which convey a different meaning, as akai a, I go, sakai a, I am satisfied with eating, and salkai a, I am angry, cross, vexed, or disturbed in mind, shi a, chekai a, and chilkai a, in the second person. I a e kai a and al kai a in the third person singular a p sa signifies to see and al pe sa straight even or right al pu a ak the general name of mercantile goods I subjoin as such a word is uncommon with them they seldom use so harsh a termination I shall here close this argument and hope enough hath been said to give a clear idea of the principles of the Indian language and dialects, its genius and idiom, and strong similarity to and near coincidence with the Hebrew, which will not be easily accounted for but by considering the American Indians as descended from the Jews.